Okay, I'll take this uh, as a cue, this uh, music fade out. <laughs> yeah, I think we can uh, slowly start. Is, uh, I guess yeah, I love this, like, the continuation of the discussions in the comments. We should, we should say those. <laughs> Or we can do it like after raising the bar. Hello, so night. Hi, Anna and Mark. Okay, I see my uh, connection is a bit unstable. Can you all hear me well? Yes, no? Yes, okay. Thank you, Elena. <laughs> Anyhow, both uh, Anna and Mark are as well uh, ASEAN, like most of us, but they kind of met in, in the 90s. They co organized the, the Project X in the 96 in Belgrade in that time, in the former Yugoslavia, which was a truly crazy time. And uh, as I got from my conversation with Anna, kind of those things were a pivoting point for them to, you know, start reconsidering of how could they, you know, do architecture and what will they do with their lives professionally, you know, uh, sort of uh, starting, you know. You can interrupt me as well, Anna Mark, if you feel like uh, saying something as well. Anyhow, they uh, formed Stealth Unlimited. I will afterwards put the link inside. And since then, they've been doing some really interesting things, mostly about, uh, you know, social activism and uh, workshops, facial interventions, exhibitions, debates, trying to, you know, steer up things about the spatial issues and uh, raise the awareness and uh, similar things. So it's been like 25 years since their own EASA event. And so let's see uh, where that, where have they ended up and what was their path. The, the floor is yours. I guess Luca shared the possibility to, to share the screen with you. It's really lovely to have you here. Welcome back, I could say. Ooh. Thanks, thanks for inviting us. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, you see, we just asked, like, would you do this? And people said yes. <laughs> yeah, I, we have been trying to connect with Amar already for a while, but this is really the first uh, chance that we have to talk about this in the context of EASA after a long time. Um, yeah, we, we met uh, in 95 and we will be speaking what, what have happened in our lives, lives since then and what kind of impact it has had. Um, uh, I would also like to thank to Francesco and Eva to, to setting the stage for this. Uh, I think it has been really great to hear their presentations as well, uh, as, as we really connect in many ways in, in what has been said before. And as Francesco was saying that he is a generation, half a generation be, before you, I think we are one generation before you. Uh, and. Um, it has been really also a pleasure for us to read your statement on the reality, real and reality. And um, as you will see, we tried somehow to connect our presentation to that and to speak like how, uh, how we formed our, uh, let's say, position towards reality and how we are in some way also building, trying to build through our practice a different reality. So I will now try, will try to share my screen. Uh, Start share screen, stop other computer sound share. Okay, continue. Thank you all for the effort to connecting like to the team and our, our own like uh, language about reality that's been created. It's really lovely. Um, I mean, it is part of our of our life and our practice. But we we when we started to think about it, yeah, it really makes sense to speak of, about it from this perspective. So uh, as I said, we met in 1995 on EASA, which took uh, p uh, place in Poland in uh, in the city of Zamość. And yeah, maybe interesting to say um, this was this was a. Uh, a moment when uh, we were uh, here in Belgrade, had our own adventures and Mark, so I come from Belgrade and Mark is Dutch, uh, was at that moment studying in uh, Delft. And this was also a point when we were, uh, we came as a group of students from, from Belgrade, EAS, with an intention to organize this event, which I will say a few words later on in 1996. 
And there was a re it was a really different time. It was a time when we had really difficulties to travel from Serbia at all to, uh, to exit, uh, first of all, the country and travel anywhere else. I have joined the ASA in 1993 for the first time. It has been really a huge, uh, huge adventure even to, to get there. And um, this uh, whole EASA context really opened our mind and for many things that we have been doing uh, since then. And as you can see from us, it can have long-term consequences, which we <laughs> never anticipated when we met in 95. So take this also as a warning. It can be sort of a reality shifting event. This is a magazine, it's called uh, The Omslag, and it was produced in the, when I was a student um, in Delft uh, by, uh, by me and my uh, colleagues, or my colleagues and me, uh, we were all students. And for some reason, we found it very important to make a magazine. I actually don't know, uh, looking in hindsight, why it had to be a magazine, but it was very, very important um, uh, sort of culmination point for us to uh, to create our own sort of like uh, framework uh, to read the things which we really wanted to read to uh, to because we thought there was a lot actually missing in what the uh, what the the faculty was uh, was offering us so we decided to uh, to somehow create it uh, create it ourselves I don't know how many of them we made at least 60 and a half I can <laughs> see here um, it it has been uh, it has been quite um, quite a sort of a forceful uh, tool for us to uh, to construct let's say uh, what we wanted to think about, but we also understood that at some point it became a sort of like a political tool that we could actually reach the rest of the faculty through this that we could influence the curriculum uh, of the faculty uh, uh, through it so. In some way, it, it opened up um, for us. It opened up our mind to the to the possibilities to to shape the environment we were uh, we were studying in, we were also living in. So that was a very important event. And the one thing that really connected us from the very beginning that we were both, uh, although coming from a very different context at that time, uh, interested in this. Uh, context beyond our schools and beyond the institutions and this is something that you will see is still continuing and uh, we have been really interested on one hand understanding how institutions work also deconstructing what they are and trying to make some kind of new institutions ourselves and uh, in 1996 uh, project x took place in belgrade in behind uh, you see this in red is is a former sugar refinery, Stara Šećerana, close to Ada here in Belgrade. And uh, we have been interested to, similar to what you are doing now in Kragovic, to uh, start a project in an abandoned factory. And the, our major reason to do this uh, was to, I mean, major reason to look for a place like this, really to step outside of the, of the, of the school and to, do something which would also redefine our uh, relationship to the to the uh, educational institution itself and this uh, project x was really uh, took place uh, half a year after the war in bosnia has ended uh, serbia was under heavy cultural economic and in any way sanctions it was very very difficult to bring bring people into the country there was a small team of us about six people who has started this whole thing and basically organized whole event on our own uh, force uh, and uh, literally work to save some money to print these booklets, send them throughout the EASA network. And the school really supported us at the very end stage of this whole thing. I think it might be interesting at some point because this year is 25 years since this event happened. Actually, there is not much uh, record of it in, in, uh, in, in any kind of domain. To maybe at some occasion and maybe even in Krago, uh, we speak a little bit more about this thing. But for now, we just take this as a starting moment for us and our, uh, our endeavor further on. And meanwhile, the uh, EASA effect started to take its toll on Anna and me. So we got uh, properly connected, uh, understood that somehow we have to, uh, to organize our lives. 
and we found ourselves for a while in the Netherlands um, and had to find a place where to live. That was something of an adventure in itself and we, we quite quickly figured out that maybe we were um, not really the renter type, that we um, we much easier aligned with, uh, with actually communities which wanted to create their own environment. And through a friend, we got connected to one particular part of the street in Rotterdam, which was under pressure to be, uh, to be evicted. Uh, but the, act the residents which were still uh, living there were inviting uh, new neighbors. And we were, um, let's say, we announced ourselves as uh, new neighbors there. And that was, for us, it was a very uh, interesting, um, interesting um, moment. On the one hand, because um, we became part of a community that was more than looking at how to live, but actually how to have a, a sort of a life together, how to do activities together, uh, how, to, um, how to also do cultural activities together. So that was uh, really interesting. And on the other hand, we, we entered this place. It was like a pretty rundown place. And we started to do uh, in practice the things which we uh, maybe should have learned in school but we were never really taught so we figured out how to uh, how to construct buildings through this uh yeah this story lasted very short basically we lived in this quote for uh, for nine months and then there came a decision city decision to demolish this uh later on this plot uh standed empty for about 10 years and uh, later on, there was a small park formed on it, but the community that was there was not welcome to continue its life, even with all the programs that were offered uh, there. And very quickly, uh, actually, because uh, we were in need to move on somewhere else, we moved a few streets further where there was a group of people who just managed to claim a, a, a bunch of buildings uh, for a self-management, self-construction project for a period of 10 years. And we moved in into this project and here um, we started to, in a very hands-on way, construct our very small but uh, space that we could experiment with and live in. And part of that was not only self-construction, but uh, to collectively manage uh, this uh, block of uh, buildings. Um, we, uh, we got, let's say, we got the key from the municipality for, uh, for a period of 10 years as a collective of, uh, of, of neighbors. Um, we're still there, so <laughs> it's like... <laughs> when in Rotterdam? <laughs> in Rot when we are in Rotterdam, we are still there, so the, the project uh, went uh, well over time. And um, actually, it's maybe interesting to, uh, uh, to say that uh, we just um, about two weeks ago with uh, the rest of our neighbors, we started talks with the municipality to see if we can actually collectively buy it from them uh, to preserve, let's say, our, uh, our future there as a, as a community initiative. And uh, we have made this, split this talk in, uh, in some kind of a chapters. And uh, as you will see, they're like related to decades. We figured out today when we were talking about it, that they're, uh, they're really per decade in some way. You, ca you can see difference in what we were doing. So this first decade, which starts with, with uh, 2000, was uh, or the end of 90s, was somehow the period of investigating reality. And the project which really formed our, uh, our way of working. And as you can see already from, from the period before that, from the, from the project X and the, the way that we also formed our conditions for living was very much related to the bottom up processes and, and forces that are shaping the city. And we were interested in that from the very beginning. And at the point when I moved from Belgrade to, to the Netherlands, uh, I started to study at the, at the Berlach Institute, which was uh, based in uh, Amsterdam at that time. And the topic which I, I brought with myself and then connected also Mark and two other people uh, which, with, with, with whom we teamed up to work on this was, uh, was a project which would end up uh, with the title Wild City. And basically what we were doing, we were very much interested in the reality on the street, in the, 
in the things that were going on, but were unnoticed and untackled with the profession here in Serbia. And it was a lot of these sort of things, as you see here, uh, street trade, uh, illegal extension of buildings, whole formation of new neighborhoods, uh, many, many things that were going on and were shaping city outside of any regulation and basically our profession was completely incapable to deal with it. And we were trying to, uh, to look at these things which were happening out there and trying to understand how they actually, how they uh, evolved. And then we came across one quite interesting book, uh, Out of Control, um, by Kevin Kelly, who compared uh, principles of lifelike systems with, um, let's say, with uh, some, uh, some of the also uh, technical and man-made uh, systems which, uh, which we can encounter. And that was for us very interesting because suddenly things which on the first hand might have looked uh, quite chaotic or uh, without any sort of patterns became much easier to interpret. Uh, so this book has had quite some influence in these early days on, uh, on our, let's say, our understanding of how to, how to categorize or how to, how to read phenomena which we, uh, which we encountered in the city. And as you can see, we were quite influenced at that time in, in, in this idea of patterns and uh, codes or genetic codes of the city. And this was our attempt to interpret uh, the phenomena that we were reading on the street in Belgrade and how in some way there were certain, uh, certain patterns that you can recognize even when we went a, uh, a step further on to from here uh, make uh, computer simulations and to try to play with this. But our basic attempt was actually to bring this closer to understanding of architects, urban planners, and speak about this in a sense where we don't see it as something which is chaotic, but, but that there are certain, let's say, steps and procedures which are possible to follow. And there were some interesting things happening around us. Uh, there were basically in the Netherlands, there were a couple of, uh, of new institutions which were dealing with, uh, with design in a quite, um, quite refreshing way, quite a, a way quite uh, different from what we, for instance, had been seeing in, uh, in during our studies. Um, one of it was the Design Institute, and the other one was uh, Institute for uh, for Unstable Media V2. And we somehow we got much more attracted to the um, to the practices which they were showing, the, the the let's say the roads and the inroads they were taking taking then the classical um, architecture or design discourse. So we were, we were really looking at, uh, at what these, uh, these places were doing. We were, uh, we were absorbing much of uh, what was going on there. And that also influenced the way how we were thinking, you know, how to, how to enter our, let's say, professional life. Because we were not so interested in, um, let's say joining uh, conventional architecture offices and you know working our way up there um, we were actually really intrigued with these uh, with these other forms of design and these other um, let's say uh, domains which were opening up so we were wondering can we actually survive from this uh, what the, the type of, uh, of of research the type of uh, explorations which we were doing and which we very much saw linked to these new things these new uh, design approaches which uh, which we saw coming up around us we had no idea what we were uh, getting into also no one told us in school how to uh, how to deal with these things so we just started some uh, somewhere and um in a way, in lack of uh, knowing how to start this, we we set up something which looked a bit like a, like an office and tried to uh, you know to do the thing. As you will see, we abandoned this idea <laughs> pretty soon. <laughs> pretty soon. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that was, as you could see, also with Project X and the working in an abandoned factory, one of the things that we were uh, for sure very much interested in was the use of already existing spaces and places. And one of the, uh, actually, our first commission. Uh, to do a, a research which was somehow continuing on the line of thought of, of the wild city where we were looking at these bottom-up processes was a research in Amsterdam, in Amsterdam North, in the, in the area which is uh, today known as NDSM terrain and 
this area, which you see here on the image, looks very different today. But there was in that period uh, uh, a sort of enthusiasm for uh, for a temporary use of spaces. There was a there was a quite influential research project which was called Urban Catalyst, with the idea how uh, cultural basically spaces, mainly cultural spaces, cultural spaces can drive uh, development of a city in a different direction, which would be less less finance driven and give a space for for different kind of users and possibilities and as you will see we we also got later on disillusioned uh with with what this was but at that point this was a very important and uh influential research for us and also connection with many interesting groups of squatter groups from amsterdam who were users of this huge hall which you see in the background of 30,000 square meters so that was the the really amazing thing which was going on here that uh, a group of people basically had crossed from the the central side of amsterdam to the the barren north and uh, had claimed um, this uh, enormous abandoned shipyard has set had set up camp there and uh, had started to uh, to transform it it was like uh, really like sort of like mind blowing and this whole research uh, ended at our feet uh, basically because of um, uh, because of an accident, you could say, because the city of Amsterdam was part of the, the research group, which was supposed to try to understand what this group of pioneers, of squatters was doing there. But the city was, the municipality was totally unable to perform such types of research. They didn't know how to connect to these people, to, they didn't know what to, to look at. So... After a while, um, uh, the municipality didn't return any results and the organizers, the main organizers of this uh, research, they got kind of like, uh, they got into a panic and they contacted us if we could step in. So this is how we ended up in this. And um, it's also to say that sometimes it can be this sort of like almost accidental things which, uh, which can, uh, can steer your... Um, let's say your uh, your development, your path in in, in directions which uh, which you can hardly anticipate, and I would say that this may be something which is quite characteristic of um, uh, of our way of operating. Is that in hindsight we find things like pretty logically lining up, but if you would ask us what would be the next step, it would be often difficult for us to precisely line outline that. And. Um... Then we jump to uh, to a few years later. Um, we have been since 2004 uh, members of, of an informal group which called itself School of Missing Studies. And School of Missing Studies have been started by a group of friends from Belgrade, from Rotterdam, from New York, uh, who were interested in exposing uh, sort of a processes in the city which were going on, which was also the, the reason for the name stealth that we choose, chose for ourselves because we were interested in invisible or, or, or processes operating under the radar. And uh, School of Missing Studies had a similar agenda and using the, the, the methodology which is outside of institutions to formulate educational projects and one of the most exciting projects of the School of Missing Studies was the Lost Highway Expedition, uh, which took place in 2006. It lasted 27 days, and it was a journey uh, through the cities of former capital cities of all the republics of former Yugoslavia plus Albania, so nine cities. Uh, and uh, it was building up on the on the on the Lost Highway was expedition was building up on the on the story of a highway of brotherhood and unity, which is the name of the highway that was connecting uh, from Slovenia uh, Austria and Slovenian border to Macedonian Greek uh, border and crossing some of these major cities of Yugoslavia, and um, in the School of Missing Studies. Uh, organize this journey actually with the, uh, originally there was an idea or invitation to organize an exhibition about the phenomena of urban phenomena happening in the Balkans uh, in, in Ljubljana and instead of doing this we have decided to uh, turn exhibition into an expedition and instead of showing images and diagrams 
we decided to invite as many people as possible to join the journey and see these cities in real and that in, in real we discuss what they are. So there was a group of eight of us who have uh, been uh, co-initiators uh, of this and then we teamed up with local organizations in all of these places. Uh, the whole thing was organized with hardly any budget. Everyone was paying for their own trip. Uh, there was no accommodation organized, there was no buses or transport organized. People traveled with various means from bicycle to uh, car to bus to uh, hitchhiking to airplanes. Uh, not everyone, uh, almost uh, not everyone joined all the trip. There were 60 people who joined actually the whole trip and about 200 people that participated in the entire journey. And as a result of this, we have also published a, a, a photo book, which is a, let's say, collective album, photo album of, of this journey. And I think that this uh, journey has been really important and influential for many of the people who joined and also host organizations, because this was the, really the first time after all the wars that stru struck uh, all, all these regions uh, was uh, connecting them physically by, by traveling. A few slides back, we told you that we had set up office and we were trying, you know, to figure out how that uh, that worked. Indeed, it didn't last very long. And shortly after this uh, expedition, we we got um, we got a call which uh, definitely shattered our um, <laughs> our office reality. We got a call uh, basically to come for uh, for a residency to uh, to Sweden, um, an art residency, uh, six months. And we were wondering how to do that. So we just had uh, had uh, rented that space. We just had to set ourselves up. And then we thought like, okay, but we have to do this. So we packed our stuff in the car and basically uh, we drove off. And we found ourselves, uh, because we were two of us, we got uh, the largest uh, studio space in Stockholm there in this, uh, in this uh, artist residency. Uh, we got a painter studio. Um, actually, our current, uh, our current house uh, would fit into it. Two uh, times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thing was like uh, 10 times 10 meters uh, uh, square, and I think the roof was uh, uh, 10 meters uh, tall, so it was an enormous space. And we were trying to figure out how to, you know, like what, what to do in this, uh, in this artistic context. And that was, an, uh, that was a quite... Um, that was quite an important moment for us to figure out actually what is this relation between what we are doing and the cultural field and how do you speak about that within a cultural context. It was a really crazy, um, a crazy uh, time because the, there was a very dense program uh, with a lot of, uh, of curators and other artists coming through and doing sort of interviews with you. So that helped us also to somehow uh, to formulate, um, let's say, a, a position and to be able to speak about our work in ways which we had not been able to do before. But definitely after this, it was very difficult to, uh, to imagine even uh, picking up a sort of an, uh, an, an office uh, lifestyle. Um, in 2008, uh, uh, almost out of, or actually out of blue, we were invited to curate the uh, Dutch Pavilion at the Architecture Biennial in Venice. And we, in a way, saw this as uh, our way to squat an institution and uh, give the stage that was by chance really given to us to turn it into something which um, would probably not be a typical national representation. And it's maybe again, it's a consequence of an, uh, of an accident because the, the Architecture Institute, which existed at that time in the Netherlands, had proposed to the, to the let's say, to the Ministry of Culture uh, an exhibition um, dealing with, uh, with the, the architecture that actually the, the Dutch army was uh, setting up on missions which were uh, going abroad. And the ministry found, found, felt very uh, sort of like uh, icky about this whole topic. So they said, well, this is what we are not going to do. Uh, go back and invent something else. And then the, uh, the institute uh, found itself in a sort of a void of a, of a good idea. And um, as a result of that, uh, decided to, uh, to look for some outside ideas of what to do in that year. It was very short term uh, invitation, like three months before the event. 
But uh, what what is? And we had never been in Venice, <laughs> so <laughs> no idea what was this whole uh, architecture uh, biannual about. So what was uh, what was really interesting? Uh, what was the whole tr trigger for our whole uh, intervention was that uh, you see here uh, on this photo Ole Bauman, who is one of the initiators of the Volume magazine, holding holding uh, something in his hands, and uh, this is a page on which there is a photo of the burned down faculty of architecture in Delft. So what happened in 2008 is that there was an enormous fire which completely destroyed the, the faculty building. And uh, it was literally after a few weeks after this fire raised to ground, there, was, there stayed no stone from this building. And this dramatic event was uh, one of the triggers for us to think of what would be our contribution to the biennial and uh, all his suggestion was somehow that we think about in terms what this new building of the Faculty of Architecture would be but as you can guess already we were not very much interested in that and with our experience of the School of Missing Studies our direction was more of thinking what would be a potential curriculum for the School of Architecture and 2008 was a year in which was already becoming clear that uh, architecture production as was going on already uh, for a while there was this term of super dutch which was uh, really like uh, like the super hyped, super hyped and uh, 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 like a top top uh, like uh, popular architecture of that time uh, completely driven on the neoliberal dogma and and the developments a lot of offices were uh, like employing a lot of people, but it was obvious as the crisis already started in 2007 in United States, this is not going to last long and that this is going to hit hard. Uh, and that was not very clear at, to everyone at that moment. So what we decided is to use the pavilion as a co-production studio, let's say, in which we would make a publication that would end the program that would together with Saskia Van Stein, who stands here uh, in the gray, gray uh, sweater, uh, who was working at that time as a curator at the, at the uh, Architecture Institute, together to make a program that would involve a lot of people. And uh, with this program, we would actually propose something that would be our imaginary curriculum, what architecture profession should be about. And uh, as you can maybe see on these uh, six, there's so, th so we produced these six publications where we try to answer uh, answers uh, for us crucial questions uh, of, of uh, moving uh, profession beyond the, the singular work into collaborative, beyond the, the economic like uh, drivers more to, so, more to social sustainability to empowerment uh, for, for to others that have not necessarily money to be our clients uh, moving from uh, artifacts into different domains and in the end thinking of of, of uh, sustainability beyond buildings so this whole program has ended on the 15th of of, uh, of september and that is the day when uh, when the basically on Wall Street, Lehman Brothers collapsed and the whole financial crisis started. So these booklets, booklets were produced in the pavilion and <laughs> with the date of 15th of September finished when this whole thing uh, uh, actually, when shit hits the fan. And it was also something like a year or five uh, after um, this whole interim use and temporary use in Amsterdam uh, had been booming. And what meanwhile became clear is that uh, the real estate market became very good in exploiting this sort of temporary uses. So these, uh, you know, like these, uh, these groups which were, able, which were willing to go into these uh, crazy abandoned parts of Amsterdam uh, and to revive them with a lot of their energy, they slowly became uh, tools in the hands of, uh, of real estate developers. And that made, us, um, that made us think whether it wasn't time somehow to, uh, to shatter this, uh, this innocence of, uh, of interim use, of temporary use. And uh, what we did is that we, we made a constitution for the interim, which basically 
um, which basically protected the uh, the interim and the temporary use from uh, exploitation, both by uh, commercial developers, but also by uh, by groups who actually maybe are not per se looking for temporary use, but are ending up there because there is nothing else available for them in the meantime. And that same year was uh, an interesting uh, step back into the Balkans for us. And since that time, we are more and more working in the Balkans and uh, living as well. 2009 uh, the, took a place the fourth uh, art Bien Tirana Art Biennials in Albania. And it has been interesting uh, because the initiators and curators of, the, of, 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 uh, of these previous editions of the panel were interested to bring the urban issues into the focus of the biennial. And uh, this hotel, which you see here, was the only uh, hotel where foreigners could stay in Albania before 1991, during the time of socialism. And the hotel has been abandoned and they have decided to turn it into the space of the, of the biennial. And we have been invited to co-curate one of the three episodes that took uh, place at that time. And what was very interesting for us uh, was that uh, Tirana was had a pretty extreme urban development at that point, but also brought us uh, to uh, our own, let's say, revisit of the region and especially cities, uh, cities in the vicinity uh, and compare what is going on. And uh, we realized that Tirana is maybe an extreme, but it is not an exception. And it led us to a series of projects which we call the City Slog. And this was a result of, of an edition that we did in Novi Sad the year after, where we were looking at and unpacking urban development constructs. And we made as a result of this a newspaper, which is, uh, let's say, simulating or playing on this tabloid format of the local newspaper at that time. This was the worst uh, local newspaper courier. So we sort of mocked their their uh, like visual language to speak about very different issues uh, than, the, than the tabloids were actually speaking about. And um, somehow that was, so that this was the, the first decade of the 2000s and uh, our era of, let's say, of our, our period of, of research. And from there on, uh, we actually figured out that uh, this is not anymore enough. This cultural context has been good for us to, to, and the research context has been good for us to map, to understand the reality or the real. And uh, we somehow figured out that in, from here on, we actually have to start to make seeds for different realities. We have seen enough of interesting examples, but maybe we have to do something else. And um, in 2010, there was an interesting invitation for us. It came out from an accidental conversation that we had with, uh, with uh, uh, curators of, uh, of another biennial, which was to take place in Banja Luka in Bosnia. And uh, the, the biennial was taking place in, in a former factory. Um, and uh, the, the, the topic of the biennial was actually looking back at the Yugoslav experience, especially at the experience of self-management and the ways of organizing. And um, I have in a conversation with Antonia and... Uh, um, Tonya and... Ivana. Ivana <laughs> yes. Uh, I have uh, mentioned that my grandparents have been uh, first uh, directors of, uh, of a local a fruit uh, a factory in the city of Banja Luka and their trajectory since then and how they came to that and actually the cooperative that they have started up in the early 50s in a small village in, in Serbia, in Dragačevo. And uh, they have been very fascinated with this and uh, send us actually <laughs> to dig through the archives and collect information about this. And, and the curators yeah, send us to, to collect information and uh, dig through the archives of, of my grandparents and bring these stories forward. And here you see a photo of the 50s with my grandmother in the middle with the women from this village and the cooperative, uh, women cooperative, weaving cooperative that she has started at that point. And this was very inspiring from, for, for us 
to actually look back at these histories and as you will see this uh, cooperative story is haunting us ever since and uh, and it will become clear in the next uh, steps how but we got as a result of the Tirana biannual we got also a call from uh, from Medellin Colombia um, to work with a group of artists there uh, at Puente Lab to work on on a sort of like extension of, um, of a cultural center in one of the most deprived neighborhoods of the city. What you're actually looking at, well, what you're actually looking at is the, the design which we, uh, which we made together with them. It's one of the few designs which we actually generated, so look at it carefully. <laughs> <laughs> it's this thing around the bus and this uh, colorful fence. But what you're actually looking at is uh, in the background is uh, is a dump. It's uh, uh, sort of like um, it was a sort of uh, emergency garbage dump uh, for the city, um, which had for for a long while been uh, been running in the city, but which became at some point became the 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 the, the location where a lot of newcomers to uh, to Medellin. Uh, started to build their houses. So on top of the garbage dump, they started to uh, to live. Uh, you can imagine the, the, the situation there was like um, uh, really appalling. Uh, apart from the, the drugs war, the whole uh, fact that you are uh, having thousands of people living on top of a garbage dump, cooking on the gas, which they uh, extracted uh, from the dump, so they're in the kitchen, they would just simply put a pipe in the ground and uh, the gas would be coming, let's say, out of the ground. Uh, that was like uh, uh, a terrible situation. But what was very interesting there is that the community there was like extremely strong, uh, strongly organized, uh, something which we had not met before, not seen before. Um, we came there as complete outsiders. Uh, we spent quite a lot of our time uh, building trust or gaining, let's say, the trust of the of that community which was living in uh, on and around the this garbage dump, uh, to be able to actually uh, work out with them what would be the the best solution for them uh, to somehow. Um, stop their life on the on the garbage dump because they also understood that that was not uh, that was not a sort of like uh, a future to be continued and to generate some programs around it through which they would also have uh, some uh, some economic activities and benefits from that it, it was um, it was it was a very uh, let's say a very uh, deep running experience for uh, for us Short after, we got a call from uh, an art institution in uh, in Gothenburg, where actually the the, the chief curator was uh, the one of the organizers of the Tirana Biennial, and um, this art center, Reda Sten, invited us to make an exhibition, or to come up with a proposal for an uh, for an exhibition to be taking place in their space. Here you see actually the space, and you see the exhibition which we uh, which we generated. Um, it's not really uh, an exhibition. It is an exhibition, but it has actually a different goal. Um, while talking with this art institute, we understood that they find themselves in uh, in an area of the city of Gothenburg, which is under uh, a huge pressure for uh, redevelopment. Basically, the whole waterfront of Gothenburg had been uh, and has been redeveloping over the past uh, decades. And they were one of the, with this art institution, they were one of the, the last outside there, just before the, 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 the real, uh, let's say, the, the harbor started. And they saw the city approaching, the new developments approaching. And they were thinking how actually they could somehow uh, claim, the, their, claim their stand there uh, in that space, but also together with many of the citizens which had had uh, come to use these areas there, these half abandoned areas of the of the city. So what we made was uh, a sort of an exhibition, which was just a trigger for interventions to be taking uh, place outside of uh, of this 
exhibition space. So the opening event was actually the, the, dis, uh, the dismembering, the dis, uh, disassembling of this uh, exhibition uh, for groups to start outside to, uh, to, to make uh, spatial interventions on the terrain. And as, um, as crazy as it, uh, it sounded and uh, as it unfolded, it has had some, uh, some effect because the municipality now has been working together with groups of residents in that area to, uh, you know, to start a dialogue about how to, uh, how to develop this, uh, this area. Um, now we move jump quickly to Bordeaux 2011. Um, we have been invited there to uh, curate a part of an exhibit, uh, actually an exhibition together with Arc and Rep uh, Architecture Center there. Uh, it was part of a big event which was called Evento. It is a sort of biennial which takes place outdoors and it's about urban space. And uh, one of the triggers was to think about the future of Bordeaux. Um, and uh, there was a story that we heard when we uh, got there that the city is supposed to grow um, to 1 million inhabitants. So from 750,000 to 1 million inhabitants. And uh, we were wondering like, what is this growth based for, for whom it is? And um, it was obvious soon after we started to look into it that this would be like a big development driven by a big companies, uh, a big capital that would be coming and doing this. And our interest was what place in this whole thing as citizens would get. So we decided to talk with many local initiatives. We have spent almost the whole year there to develop this project. And as a result of all these interviews and conversations, we decided to make a fictional story that would bring all these elements into a story about the city in 2030, through which we would see, a, which we would, could imagine a silhouette of a different city. And here is illustration of one of the artists from the city that has interpreted part of this fictional story that we have been writing together with a, with a philosopher who is from Bordeaux and uh, with a colleague, Emil Jortsan from Pula, from Croatia. Um, the exhibition took place on the former uh, slaughterhouse uh, terrain, or actually at that time, it was still a slaughterhouse. And this big circle was the outdoor e exhibition that was also gathering various of these ideas and initiatives into this one circle where basically we could reflect on them in, in, an, in a collective image. But this also marked somehow the end uh, of, um, of a set of, uh, of, of engagement of maybe a way of working for us because we understood that even if we had spent like months and months in the city, had actually lived there for a couple of months, um, it, you know, like all this energy somehow um, was about to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, 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 to leave through the drain. You come there, you, you spend uh, an enormous amount of time and energy, you work with a lot of local initiatives, uh, you have an event and after that you pack up and go somewhere else again. And we understood that like that, we are not going to really to, uh, to alter, uh, alter uh, reality in a direction which uh, for us was, uh, was really necessary. So we felt really uh, exhausted at that point and we, we, had, we came to the, we came to the um, let's say, to the understanding that uh, what, we, what we should do maybe should be something which is uh, longer term um, engagements maybe also in the cities which were uh, closest to our, uh, let's say, to our, uh, uh, our existence, Rotterdam and Belgrade, and to, um, you know, to work on, on building up structures which are able to stand time. I will jump on. Yeah. So in 2012, in Belgrade, we started something uh, which uh, was also mentioned by Eva, uh, which is an initiative uh, around, um, which is called uh, Smarter Building, with the idea to collectively construct affordable non-speculative housing. Um, this is an initiative started by Kogradi Grad, uh, who builds the city, which is an association which we have started in beginning of, in 2010, so it's more than 10 years that it, it exists. 
But this here on this image is the is one of the very first events of what would become a, a smarter building cooperative, which we have uh, registered so far. Uh, since then, we actually have started to search for the possibilities how to create this uh, housing alternatives. And this really is a very long story and could take a really a, a whole lecture on its own. But it's one of the major things that we are uh, actually working on at this very moment. And in parallel with that, in Rotterdam, we started to uh, to look at something which is quite uh, quite similar, or also deals with the, you know, with the, the the position of housing or actually living in the city uh, today. Um, we got hands on um, a bunch of abandoned buildings, basically uh, the toxic fallout of the market crash, the 2008 market crash buildings which were uh, left empty, which were uh, maybe going to be boarded up for a period of 10 years. And we started to negotiate with the owner whether we could give them a different future. So not have them boarded up for 10 years, but um, uh, keep them active or make them active again, uh, make them available for uh, affordable forms of, uh, of living and also of working. And in 2014, we managed to negotiate uh, this, let's say, the transfer of these uh, buildings for a period of uh, 10 years. 10 years looked really uh, long <laughs> at that time. <laughs> Meanwhile, we are uh, already halfway uh, through more this. Than yeah, more than halfway through this, uh, through this adventure. And as I said, the cooperatives are haunting us ever since we started to dig into also our personal family history. Uh, uh, meanwhile, we have become members and initiators of a number of, of, of cooperatives. And one of the cooperatives that we joined is a Croatian one. It's called Cooperative for Ethical Finance with the idea to establish the first ethical bank uh, in our region, a bank that would be driven by different principles than uh, simply making uh, making a profit and financing just the profitable things. It has been very influential for us to to uh, to join this actually and expand our views of what is possible. When we started to uh, to work with the issue of housing uh, in Belgrade, we quickly figured out that the model which we were the most interested in, sort of like novel. Uh, version of uh, cooperative housing, co-housing, community-led housing, was something which was simply not around. And um, we got in touch with a number of, uh, of peers of, let's say, similar initiatives in the countries uh, around us here. Um, and we figured out that uh, these groups were uh, more or less at the same situation like we were. They had an idea of where to go but there were no examples of that in their own surrounding and they uh, were facing an environment which uh, didn't support much of their, uh, their efforts. So what we did is that we, uh, we teamed up with them um, and formed a network called MOBA. And MOBA is, uh, is this network of emerging housing cooperatives from uh, Ljubljana, from Zagreb, um, from uh, Budapest, from Prague and Belgrade. Um, so 10 years after the, the economic crash and global financial cr uh, crisis, uh, we published this book, which is called Upscale and Training Commoning, Constructing a Future That Is Yet to Be, which basically tracks 10 years of our own development in this period. And in some way, it's a mirror to this publication that we made in Venice. So it tries actually, at that time, we kind of made a manifesto how the profession we think cur curriculum for the profession could be and uh, through this book we try to reflect what, ac what actually happened with us and how did we transform our own practice and existence ever since. Um, and Yere I think is somewhere here also on this call. Uh, in 2018 uh, we have been invited to contribute and uh, work together with Emil and uh, Jurzen on the, on the Zagreb Salon of Architecture. And the Salon was also looking at this period of 2008 uh, to 2018 and how uh, 
the, the economic crisis has influenced the architectural profession. What is, I think, important to mention, and I don't know for, for you, for younger generation, how apparent that is, but the 2008 crisis, both in the Netherlands and in Croatia and everywhere, in principle, with these two countries we know the best, has quite influenced the, the architectural production, uh, employment of architects, specifically life of young architects. And uh, one of the things that we came up with uh, was the, the, the actually involvement of a few uh, uh, local associations of, of architects, especially including local architects to think of what is the future of the next 10 years. And with Jere uh, Kuzmanic, uh, we have made a story, which is through uh, a story about five cities in Croatia, uh, pictures what, uh, how that future can be. And I can just tell you, you can find it online, but I can just tell you that reality is pretty close to what we have predicted. And 2012 has been crazily close to what the story that we have invented is speaking about. And in line of this, um, we continued, let's say, speculating about the, 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 the future tra trajectory of uh, initiatives uh, like us. Um, we got a call for an, uh, for an exhibition uh, in Korea, South Korea. Um, and we were, in a way, we were wondering, you know, like, what are we going to, uh, to represent or present there? And are we at all interested in that? And we... The topic was collective city. Yeah. And we just had this experience of uh, getting together with a number of people and uh, trying to extrapolate the future, which, you know, you maybe should be arriving at. Um, we thought it was very interesting. So what we did is that we, uh, we again, we gathered a small team, uh, Jer Kuzmanic and Predak Milic, Anna and me, and we did our own uh, sort of like uh, future telling on our own practices. And one of the, uh, I mean, the major thing that we were dreaming about and thinking about was uh, how these initiatives, uh, cooperative-based, uh, local things, what is going to be their meaning in the future, in the 10 years to come. And we somehow saw them on one hand as these sort of lighthouses, uh, which are uh, their sort of a seeds of a, of a different societies, but also somehow enterprises of survival things that will be important for survival. And as there was a question on this previous slide, like, are, we, are, are you well accompanied? That it is very important that in the times that are coming, and obviously COVID is also proving this already, the climate change and various crises which are going to come ahead of us are uh, pointing to that we need to create uh, very, very different circumstances to live in and survive than the ones that we are living in today. And on the left side of this uh, image, you see uh, sort of a giant uh, solar plant. And it might not be coincidental that uh, we set up an energy cooperative in, uh, in the same year. Uh, it's, the, it's one of the first ones here in, uh, in, our, uh, in our region. And the idea is basically that uh, it would allow people to, uh, to start generating uh, their own energy for their own use on their own uh, premises. And um, here we are coming to the end. As I said, the, the first decade was a research, second decade was somehow setting the seeds or, or some kind of framework in which these different realities are uh, can possibly evolve. I have to say that most of these cooperatives that we have been set, setting from housing to mobile uh, network uh, to uh, en el electropioneries energy cooperative are all still uh, not fully developed or fully functional. Uh, they are all pioneers. And uh, what we hope that this next decade is, is bringing is to making them more concrete and constructing these different realities. And uh, what we uh, hope that it becomes clear from this, what we are telling is that in some way we are building an ecosystem of new institutions. And uh, what is very important for us is potential also of connecting them, so 
for connecting a housing cooperative with energy cooperative with financing uh, and with this that we are once what we were drawing is an image of a possible city uh, or possible society in Bordeaux in 2011, 10 years ago, could finally start becoming a reality where these things are then run for real and are uh, many more people are joining them. So yeah, we hope, I mean, that this is really going to be the decade of constructing. <laughs> And I can stop to share the screen. Okay. Oh my God, T thank you so much. And now I would like to invite everyone to turn on their cameras and mics so we can do a round of applause for all of our amazing lectures for Riva and Francesco and for Mark and for Anna. And then we can continue to questions. Okay, please, please join us. Let's make some noise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all, guys. Yeah. You were like amazing. Wow, we did oh. just didn't have a lot of commands, meanwhile. <laughs> Super. Could not follow them. Okay, I don't know. Has anybody wants to start the conversation? Ask something, comment. <laughs> Everybody's shy, but after this, after Francesco's lecture, like the the, the chat. Chat room was on fire, so please don't be shy. If you're shy, write it down. Somebody else will read it for you. <laughs> Maybe I can just uh, throw one thing in. This is that yes. um, uh, what you saw are a number of, um, let's say, at points at our uh, trajectory, but um, uh, it is definitely not the result of a careful career path which we drafted. So, you know, like, I just wanted to give you that as a sort of an input, like, it, like these things also unfold and we never had planned it exactly like this. Uh, when you look back, maybe things like click into each other and look like uh, they are like somehow naturally evolving from the one to the, to the other. But definitely, it's not something which we uh, which we could have uh, seen coming like this. But one thing which was for sure, we didn't want to work in someone else's office. That was for sure, and That's we a good start. And we never did. And the other thing was that uh, we didn't want to do competitions. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And Pablo wrote one very, very sweet thing, which was ex actually my first thought as well when I managed to, to meet you and contact you. Like, he said, like, oh, future ourselves, like us as, you know, current. Uh, so it's like, yeah, maybe, maybe this is our future. That would be lovely. So I don't know if, if anything sure else, it's it, very hopeful. Yeah, it's for sure. It's a, it's a possible uh, future. <laughs> I don't think that uh, you know everyone needs to uh, to take such a path, but you know you also don't have to be afraid to uh, to take it if that is something which somehow um, uh, starts calling you. <laughs> and yeah, one of the major things also that we discovered, as Mark said in the beginning, we tried to form this office, and uh, the, the, this idea was like uh, we had no better framework to think about. But later on, we realized that. Actually, what we are good in and what we uh, uh, can do really well is to collaborate with many, many people. And maybe that was not apparent in the talk itself, but all of this stuff that we did have been collaboration with numerous people and uh, that we connected with because we thought that we have good synergies, that we can produce something together. And, uh, and that has been very important for us. Amazing, <laughs> super lovely. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to say a, a couple of things. Can you hear? Yeah. yeah. Yes. No, oh, I think uh, fantastic presentation. Really, uh, I did. I knew some of the projects, but it, it's it's very nice to see them. Let's say uh, put in a line because yeah, I mean probably. Uh, no, it's it is clear that there is yes, it's an unconventional path to architecture, but it's let's say it's probably one of the most interesting uh, architecture like paths as uh, spatial practitioners, which is, I think, uh, the, yeah, the ambition that all of us uh, uh, are cultivating rather than uh, 
they're really designing, like decorating uh, uh, a very cheap building uh, um, that is designed entirely by the market dynamics. Um, I, I wanted to say, especially, let's say, also for people uh, that for, I think from your uh, talk are going to start to be intrigued with forms of congregation, like, for instance, a cooperative, that uh, from my perspective, I've seen lately um, like a, a very interesting uh, uh, resurgence, I would say, of, uh, of these type of uh, ways to, to organize around, this, like, around the same mission. Uh, and sometimes even helped by, um, by technological tools that might not be at first glance considered friendly. Uh, so, for instance, I mean, we, um, I think in a, in a couple of weeks, uh, we have a documentary, like an interactive documentary uh, to launch, which is, which is, uh, for, uh, for instance, about the, the, um, the implications of the blockchain on how people create trust in society. So not really the technological side, but really the social side of it. And curiously, throughout the research and the shooting of this documentary, we found out that actually the blockchain itself is considered to be one of the most interesting uh, tools for cooperatives, for old ways of congregating around the mission like a cooperative, because it provides um, a financial layer that in several cases instead um, can be longer to achieve. I mean, can take longer to achieve. Uh, so we were dealing with, with people that instead of, let's say, the typical, oh, the Bitcoin bubble uh, is going to burst or just the finance or, or so on and so forth. Um, in that case, for instance, we found out that that was a type of technology that people in cooperatives, writing articles of associations, we're seeing a lot of hope in, which is quite fascinating, I think. So yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it's not it's not a question. It's just uh, uh, like some more hope. No, but it's absolutely true, and um, we find ourselves uh, sometimes um, uh, using uh, or even. Uh, programming this sort of like uh, tools <laughs> this, um, for instance uh, for for our network of, uh, of housing cooperatives MOBA uh, we've been working with uh, with a finance design tool because for starting cooperatives it's like uh, it's extremely challenging to think of how you how do you actually get an overview of not just of, uh, of you know, like what are you going to invest in, but how are you going to run buildings for a longer period? How do you make sure that uh, if your goal is affordability, that you achieve something like that? Where do you start from? So there we, more or less coming out of nowhere, we decided to, uh, to make a, a finance um, sort of review tool which, uh, which is now uh, used among uh, the different members of this uh, cooperative. And in several other places, we found ourselves in, let's say, this odd situation that you are becoming expert in a field which you never had uh, dreamt of being an expert in. Um, yeah, so now being, for instance, uh, um, uh, one of the initiators, co-initiators of an energy cooperative, uh, we are looking deep into the logic of, uh, you know, of the whole uh, energy transactions. Uh, blockchain is also coming around the corner as a ledger, a way to administrate this sort of transaction. So it's like uh, sometimes really puzzling, but it's also, it's, um, it's, it's uh, I would say it's refreshing because you open doors which you, uh, which you normally would never have opened. So that that can be really interesting to do. Yeah, I remember here, around here, the, the Kugel had uh, a, similar, uh, mm -hmm. a similar ambition with some solar panels and it was like a, a prototype. But uh, no, basically what, I'm, what, I'm, uh, what I wanted simply to stress is that 
really. I mean, there is a tendency, especially in, um, in people with a very strong um, uh, social ambition, uh, to see technology as some sort of evil enemy uh, that instead, uh, what I mean is that instead it can come to your advantage once again. If, if managed right, I mean, usually the people can uh, have the tendency to, to, to do this these strange dichotomy between the social on one side and uh, uh, the, the hyper technology on the other side, which I think is, is false. And, uh, and I wanted to stress it. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it, it's nice to see also you collaborating with so many people uh, that I'm sure were also involved uh, in developing uh, technologies at some point. Uh, so that's, it's more, it's more to reassure that, uh, that everybody didn't see this dichotomy uh, as often it happens. Oh, the rock and roll. <laughs> Yere, do you want to tell what is in the forecast for 2022? So in the, wait, 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 microphone, yeah. It's in on. The forecast for 2022. Wait, what was the, first was split, then was Shibanik. Oh, well, Shibonik was all about combining technology and the community, but in the way to close ourselves away from all this speculative, uh -huh. monstrous market. Like Shibonik is the city on the coast, like most of you know, totally destroyed by tourism. And then we were imagining how people can close themselves away from, uh, from, from this tourist uh, mayhem to some kind of uh, commoning and actually quite cooperative uh, uh, social micro system. Let's see what happens with that because tourism died meanwhile. So <laughs> this one might be a little bit of... <laughs> well, we have one year to recover. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> For those of us who see the sea. Yeah. <laughs> A bit of silence. <laughs> we can keep it at that. We were having like a, a chat like amongst our team and we were like wondering, okay, but um, how do we actually make a living with all of these uh, beautiful things that you're doing? And I'm guessing it's like writing projects as the way to, to push it through. Yeah? Yeah, one part is that. Uh, well, it depends, really, it depended on the period. When we were doing these uh, artistic or curatorial commissions, that was our major source of income. At this point, we mainly don't do this. So we really depend on these projects that we're doing in Belgrade and in Rotterdam. And our, our finance is much worse, I have to tell. <laughs> But we managed. I mean, we managed to survive. <laughs> we can see that. <laughs> no, it's just about, uh, it's not maybe the, the most uh, comfortable question, but we are, you know, in the manner of this topic reality, just trying also to make things transparent. Because as you said, like, uh, uh, you know, people should be also encouraged to take this uh, path, which is not the most common one. Uh, but, uh, you know, the biggest worry is like, okay, can I really survive in that? Like, uh, you know, what uh, all things that like li life brings and that how you have to support yourself and all those basic boring questions. <laughs> yeah, I think it comes back to this genius career plan, which we, uh, <laughs> which we laid out to Definitely. you. <laughs> so in the beginning of, uh, let's say, of, uh, of us uh, running, let's say, our practice, we were pretty nervous about this. Like, uh, we also noticed, for instance, that there is some, in, in our practice, it might, in, in anyone's uh, practice, it might be different, but there is a sort of like a cyclical thing that, um, 
somehow at the start of each year, there is a huge uh, vacuum uh, where the telephone doesn't ring, you know, like no one is like uh, going to ask you anything. There is nothing coming and you think like, are we going to survive? But after a few years, we understood that that is apparently the rhythm which it takes, at least for us. Uh, so we got over this sort of uh, nervous uh, nervousness with that. And then, of course, we make a living from a combination of um, things which come to us, uh, being them, uh, for instance, cultural commissions, like uh, to uh, you know, like uh, to uh, coordinate or to curate an exhibition or to give uh, you know a, a work for some uh, for an exhibition or something like that, or to make uh, you know, like to make some sort of cultural production. And on the other hand, things which we uh, initiate ourselves. So maybe um, I think that uh, probably it's, it generally was something like half-half. I'm not exactly sure, uh, but half would be coming to us. And the other half are things which we, uh, which we set up ourselves and which we then are looking for uh, funding for, uh, being them subsidies or something like that. And um, it shifts now a little bit because we are entering now these, uh, these cooperative structures. And these cooperative structures are also to some degree economic vehicles. So you come together there as members to make some sort of economic reality possible. And um, I think that will slowly start to, uh, to generate also some of the, of the income which, uh, which, we will, uh, which we will have. It's a bit too early to say that, but uh, I don't think you have to be, you can really like ask these things. Uh, people normally don't talk about it, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's like really no, uh, no issue. Thank you so much for the answer because usually we kind of get stuck like okay how the fuck will i make a living i have to go and live back with my parents like what do i do now and then you get stuck in the office because you just don't know but now with this this process of organizing things even though we haven't been very lucky with it but we learned a lot about like writing projects and like how how we can get some resources and stuff but you know times are tricky with this you know covid slash us at times <laughs> so yeah. thank you Another thing is that we live with very little. Uh, we have, we, we are used to living with very little. Yeah. And, uh, we never expanded to this kind of uh, <laughs> uh, window of how much you need. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, there are also some things which can, uh, which are more or less accidental and which can help you along the way. Like uh, at the point when um, when we finished, let's say, our education, um, there was a quite good infrastructure in the Netherlands for, uh, for young architects to start their offices. And it's something which was uh, for, for a while pretty helpful for us. There were, for instance, there were uh, grants for starting, uh, you know, like for architects which wanted to start their own practice. Now you can hardly dream about this sort of uh, realities, but that was the situation back then. In the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, yes. And of course there are, you know, like probably for each generation, there is something to latch on to, and it, it, it will be for your generation, it will be a different thing, which will uh, give you maybe that, uh, that, that little uh, starter to, uh, to be able to do that. And that might be something completely different from this uh, cultural starting subsidies which were available for our generation. Maybe now it's a certain type of job which you pick up and which will just provide you the, the you know, like the seed funding to, uh, you know, to set up something uh, where you want to roll into. Thank you very much for like enrolling into this conversation, reading the daughter's comments. She's like, that's it. Let's talk about the backstage more. It's terribly needed. And we all like really feel this because usually with all of these presentations, we only get the, the, the shiny products and not like what the work or, uh, you know, the strain and the finances and everything else what is needed. And it just seems like so much out of reach sometimes. That's true. I mean, we completely agree with this. That's what we are always most interested in, also ourselves, like these backstage stories. 
at the, the bottom of the cube. <laughs> Where does this all stand on? If I if I can add two cents, basically on uh, on for instance this last project, that was for that was a documentary. I mean, it was born as a literally as a research project. You know, when architects uh, when when they don't know what's going to come out, they say it's a research project. Uh, and uh, so it was it was born like that. And that to a certain extent, for instance, allowed us, of course, us being part uh, uh, here in the Netherlands of, uh, of a pretty privileged uh, environment for subsidies. Still, I mean, decreasing uh, enormously from, from uh, already 15 years ago, but still, uh, um, still alive. Um, what we were doing, this ambiguity in what would have come out of it allowed us, for instance, to pitch the same exact project um, to several different funds. So um, we started to, to one fund, we, we pitched it as a journalistic research because we were a magazine. We were like, yeah, you know, we've been dealing with printing for so long and we want to re reinvent the talking head interview. To another one, we were pitching exactly the same shit as um, as uh, basically a way to uh, to to recreate interactivity in uh, in um, interviews. So and there was a film subsidy. Then there was another one that was, for instance, for immersive interactive stuff. And to that we were pitching exactly the same thing, showing a different side. So in that way, and then of course we wanted the speakers to fly to Amsterdam in order to shoot here, to shoot the interviews with them here. And we pitched to uh, another one that was creating basically, that was supporting live events in Amsterdam. So it was this strange basically castle of cards uh, that was all balancing one on top of the other and was creating, so if you have a project, that's what I mean. If you have a project that might be very appealing to several funds, not just one. I mean, because every, every project that we do is, especially in this realm and with this mentality that, that definitely has a shows, has so many different sides. Um, and, uh, and so you might appeal to many more with, with exactly the same thing. And then it's, yeah, knowing how to manage a budget, but I think you're better than me already in that. Because the reality of the Balkans is much more harsh regarding the funds. No, don't, don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But sometimes, for instance, finding a partner in the Netherlands allows you yes. uh, to, to be able. So, yeah, it's, um, it is that. And then also, yeah, understanding that, for instance, not all grants are equal. Um, here, there's fairly easy going also with the reporting. If you're applying to a European fund, which might be a no cap, so you can go as high as you want and they say yes or no, but the reporting is hell on earth. And you know better than me, I can see you nodding already the tear coming down. But uh, so yeah, just just saying, it's, it is possible. Uh, also, let's say to, to structure a like uh, to manage to structure uh, a little bit of funding. Of course, you're not going to go out in a Tesla, <laughs> but uh, but you might be able to buy yourself a new bike if they steal it. Let's put it like that. Please, the bike. Well. I also want to thank to to all of you like for contributing tonight and. Uh, and just to say, you said like seeing Kragujevac and maybe we can also like collaborate even before the event. Um, we have sort of this uh, Facebook group. Um, it's uh, meant to be for brainstorming uh, for all the other events on different topics. So this, this topic, yeah. Uh, so you can just maybe if you have Facebook, you know, you can just uh, drop by sometimes there if you have some you know, idea about some book that uh, we, you think we should read or about some uh, interesting project or about just anything, you know? Uh, and this is also like for the whole community, like, uh, and uh, yeah. 
and in general. I mean, we really are looking forward to, you know, and see you in Kragujevac, uh, all of you, and to continue this whole story, because I really believe that you have a lot more to say than uh, just this uh, one hour thing. And uh, it's very, very inspiring, like uh, what you shared to tonight with us. Like, uh, I mean, all, everyone, <laughs> like literally, just uh, it, it uh, came like you weren't present at our workshop today like uh, uh, that was very very productive and then this came as a amazing continuation of the whole day and it uh, answered so many um, and questions and some uh, it prolonged some stories that we started today so um, also I said before like we're gonna make a whole transcript about the workshops that we had uh, so you can also hear like uh, thoughts of the community because now lots of people didn't um, uh, turn on the mic to say something like there are definitely like lots of people. Uh, but if you are interested, you can also check that out, you know, and just see how, how everyone feels about all of the whole project and uh, what, what might be the next steps. And uh, maybe Tamara wants to say something more <laughs> or someone else. I feel called out. <laughs> I was just like answering things in the chat. We put it, the, the link in the chat for the brainstorm group. I see both Luca and I did. <laughs> so you can check it out. It was there already. 